One Sunday morning. Ida always went to the seven o'clock Sunday morning service at her church. Usually she heard the clanging of the church bells while she was eating breakfast. But this morning she heard them while she was still in bed. That means I'm late, she thought. Ida jumped out of bed, quickly dressed, and left without eating or looking at the clock. It was still dark outside, but it usually was dark at this time of year. Ida was the only one on the street. The only sounds she heard were the clatter of her shoes on the pavement. Everybody must already be in church, she thought. Ida took a shortcut through the cemetery. Then she quietly slipped into the church and found a seat. The service had already begun. When she caught her breath, Ida looked around. The church was filled with people she had never seen before. But the woman next to her did look familiar. Ida smiled at her. It's Josephine Kerr, she thought. But she's dead. She died a month ago. Suddenly, Ida felt uneasy. She looked around again. As her eyes began to adjust to the dim light, Ida saw some skeletons in suits and dresses. This is a service for the dead, Ida thought. Everybody here is dead, except me. Ida noticed that some of them were staring at her. They looked angry, as if she had no business there. Josephine Kerr leaned toward her and whispered, Leave right after the benediction, if you care for your life. When the service came to an end, the minister gave his blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you, he said. The Lord make his face to shine upon you. Ida grabbed her coat and walked quickly toward the door. When she heard footsteps behind her, she glanced back. Several of the dead were coming toward her. Others were getting up to join them. The Lord lift up his countenance to you, the minister went on. Ida was so frightened she began to run. Out the door she ran with a pack of shrieking ghosts at her heels. Get out, one of them screamed. Another shouted, you don't belong here, and ripped her coat away. As Ida ran through the cemetery, a third grabbed the hat from her head. Don't come back, it screamed, and shook its arm at her. By the time Ida reached the street, the sun was rising, and the dead had disappeared. Did this really happen, Ida asked herself, or have I been dreaming? That afternoon, one of Ida's friends brought over her coat and hat, or what was left of them. They had been found in the cemetery, torn to shreds. Sounds. The house was near the beach. It was a big old place where nobody had lived for years. From time to time, somebody would force open a window or a door and spend the night there, but never longer. Three fishermen, caught in a storm, took shelter there one night. With some dry wood they found inside, they made a fire in the fireplace. They lay down on the floor and tried to get some sleep, but none of them slept that night. First they heard footsteps upstairs. It sounded like there were several people moving back and forth, back and forth. When one of the fishermen called, Who's up there? The footsteps stopped. Then they heard a woman scream. The scream turned into a groan and died away. Blood began to drip from the ceiling into the room where the fishermen huddled. A small red pool formed on the floor and soaked into the wood. A door upstairs crashed shut, and again a woman screamed. Not me, she cried. It sounded as if she was running, her high heels tapping wildly down the hall. I'll get you, a man shouted, and the floor shook as he chased her. Then, silence. There wasn't a sound 
until the man who had shouted began to laugh. Long peals of horrible laughter filled the house. It went on and on until the fishermen thought they would go mad. When finally it stopped, the fishermen heard someone coming down the stairs, dragging something heavy that bumped on each step. They heard him drag it through the front hall and out the front door. The door opened, then it slammed shut. Again, silence. Suddenly, a flash of lightning filled the house with a green blaze of light. A ghastly face stared at the fishermen from the hallway. Then came a crash of thunder. Terrified, they ran out into the storm. A weird blue light. Late one night in October 1864, a Confederate blockade runner slipped by some Union gunboats at the entrance to Galveston Bay in Texas and made it safely to port with its cargo of food and other necessities. Lewis Billings, the master of the small vessel, was getting ready to weigh anchor when he was startled by a shriek from one of the crew. A strange old-fashioned schooner with a big black flag was rushing down at us, Billings said later. She was afire with a sort of weird, pale blue light that lighted up every nook and cranny of her. The crew was pulling at the ropes and doing other work, and they paid us no attention, didn't even glance our way. They all had ghastly, bleeding wounds, but their faces and eyes were those of dead men. The man who had shrieked had fallen to his knees, his teeth chattering as he gasped out a prayer. Overcoming my own terror that was chilling the very marrow of my bones, I rushed forward, shouting to the others as I ran. Suddenly, the schooner vanished before my eyes. Some say that it was the ghost of Jean Lafitte's pirate ship, Pride, that sank off Galveston Island in 1821 or 1822. She was seen again in 1892 in the same waters with the same crew. Somebody fell from aloft. I had signed on as an ordinary seaman on the falls of Ettrick, a merchant ship bound for England. First time I saw that ship, I knew her right away. She was the old Gertrude Spurshoe. I'd sailed on her years before when she was painted brown and gold. Now she was painted black and had a new name, but it was the same ship for sure. We had a pretty good crew for that voyage, except for one hard-looking ticket named McLaren. He was a pretty good seaman, but there was something about him that I didn't trust. He was kind of secretive, kept mostly to himself. One day, somebody told him that I had worked on the old Gertrude. For some reason, he got all a tremble over that. Then I catched him giving me all these ugly black looks as if he was itching to knife me in the back. I guessed it had something to do with the Gertrude, but I didn't know what. Well, this one day, we was trying to work our way through a dripping black fog. You'd scarcely know we had all the lights on. And it was dead calm. There wasn't a breath of fresh air. The ship just lay there, wallowing in a trough, a rolling and a rolling, going nowheres. I was standing my watch around midships, and McLaren was doing his trick at the wheel. The rest of the crew was scattered around one place or another. It was quiet as could be. Then, all at once, wacko! This thing hits the deck right in front of McLaren. He lets go a screech that turns my blood cold, and he falls down in a faint. The second mate starts yelling that somebody has fallen from aloft. Laying out there, just forward of the wheel, was someone or something 
dressed in oilskins with blood oozing out from underneath. The captain ran and fetched a big light from his cabin so he could see who it was. They kind of straightened him out to get a good look at his face. He was a big, ugly-looking devil, but nobody knew who he was or what he was doing up there. At least, nobody was saying... When McLaren came to from his faint, they tried to get something out of him. All he did was jabber away and keep rolling those big, wild-looking eyes of his. Everybody was getting more and more excited. We all wanted to heave the body overboard as quick as we could. There was something weird about it, as if it wasn't real. But the captain wasn't so sure about getting rid of it that way. Could it be a stowaway, he asked. But the ship was so filled with lumber we were carrying, there was no space where a living thing could hide for three weeks, which is how long we had been out. Even if it was a stowaway, what was it doing aloft on such a dirty day? There was no reason for anybody to be up there. There was nothing to see. Finally... The captain gave up and told us to heave him overboard. Then nobody would touch him. The mate ordered us to pick him up, but nobody made a move. Then he tried coaxing, but that didn't do any good. Suddenly, that loony McLaren starts yelling, I handled him once, and I can handle him again. He picks up the body and staggers over to the railing with it. He is just about to throw it overboard when it wraps its two big, long arms around him, and over they go together. Then, on the way down, one of them starts laughing in a horrible way. The mates are yelling to launch a boat, but nobody would get into a boat not on a night like that. We threw a couple of life preservers after him, but everybody knew they wouldn't help. So that was that. Or was it? The first chance I had to go home after that, I went right over to see old Captain Spurshoe, who was captain when the Gertrude was around. Well, he says, one trip these two outlandish men shipped aboard the Gertrude. One was McLaren, the other was a really big fella. The big one was uh, always picking on McLaren and thumping him around and McLaren was always talking about how he would get back at him. Well, this wet, dirty night, the two of them was up there alone, and the big one, come flying down, killed himself deader in a herring. McLaren says the foot rope they were using parted, and how he almost fell himself. But everybody who saw that rope knew she didn't give away on her own. She had been cut through with a knife. After that, whenever we came into port, McLaren thought we were going to get the police after him, and he'd get pretty scared. But we couldn't prove anything, so uh, we didn't try. In the end, I guess the big fella took care of things in his own way. If he was a ghost that came back, that's what he was. If there be things like ghosts. The Little Black Dog Billy Mansfield said that a little black dog followed him wherever he went. But he was the only one who saw it, so people thought he was kind of crazy. To drive the dog away, Billy was always hollering at it, throwing rocks at it. But the dog always came back. The first time Billy saw that dog was the day he fought Silas Burton. Billy was just a young man then, but the Burtons and Billy's family had been feuding for years. When Billy saw Silas riding toward him, he went for his gun, and Burton went for his, but Billy fired first. He hit Burton in the back, knocking him from his horse. Burton's horse ran off, and his gun fell where he couldn't reach it. He lay there on the ground, pleading with Billy not to kill him. 
but Billy killed him anyway. Burton's little black dog was with him when he was shot. The dog kept licking Burton's face and barking and snarling at Billy. In his anger, Billy killed the dog, too. There wasn't much law enforcement in those days, so Billy wasn't arrested. But all that night, he heard Burton's dog outside his cabin, scratching on his door and barking to be let in. I'm imagining this, Billy said to himself. I shot that dog. It's dead. But the next morning, Billy saw the dog. It was waiting for him outside. From then on, there was not a day when he didn't see it. And there wasn't a night when he didn't hear it scratching on his door, barking to be let in. From then on, Billy was always finding black dog hairs on the sofa, on the floor, in his bed, even in his food. And the house and the yard stank of dog. That's what Billy said. Whenever somebody told him there wasn't any dog to see, he'd say, maybe, maybe you don't see it, but I do, and I'm not any crazier than you are. Things went on like that for many years. Then one morning, in the middle of the winter, the neighbors didn't see any smoke coming out of Billy's chimney. When they went over to check, Billy wasn't there. A day or so later... They found his body lying in the snow in a field back of his cabin. Billy had plenty of enemies, and at first it seemed like somebody might have killed him. But there wasn't a mark on his body, and there weren't any footprints out there except for Billy's. The doctor said Billy probably died of old age, but there was something odd about his death. When the neighbors found Billy, there were black dog hairs on his clothes. There were even a few on his face. It smelled like a dog had been out there. Yet no one had seen a dog anywhere. Clinkety-clink. An old lady got sick and died. She had no family and no close friends, so the neighbors got a grave digger to dig a grave for her, and they had a coffin made, and they placed it in her living room. As was the tradition, they washed her body and dressed her up in her best clothes and put her in the coffin. When she died, her eyes were wide open staring at everything and seeing nothing. The neighbors found two old silver dollars on her dresser, and they put them on her eyelids to keep them closed. They lit candles and sat up with her so that she would not be too lonely on that first night that she was dead. The next morning a preacher came and said a prayer for her. Then everybody went home. Later, the gravedigger arrived to take her to the cemetery and bury her. He stared at the silver dollars on her eyes, and he picked them up. How shiny and smooth they were, how thick and heavy. They're beautiful, he thought, just beautiful. He looked at the dead woman. With her eyes wide open, he felt she was staring at him, watching him, hold her coins. It gave him a creepy feeling. He put the coins back on those eyes of hers to keep them closed. But before he knew it, his hands reached out again and grabbed the coins and stuck them in his pocket. Then he grabbed a hammer and quickly nailed shut the lid on the coffin. Now you can't see anything, he said to her. Then he took her out to the cemetery and he buried her as fast as he could. When the gravedigger got home, he put the two silver dollars in a tin box and shook it. The coins made a cheerful, rattling sound. But the gravedigger wasn't feeling cheerful. He couldn't forget those eyes looking at him. When it got dark, 
a storm came up, and the wind started blowing. It blew all around the house. It came in through the cracks and around the windows and down the chimney. It went. The fire flared and flickered. The gravedigger threw some fresh wood on the fire, got into bed, and pulled the blankets up to his chin. The wind kept blowing. It went. The fire flared and flickered and cast evil-looking shadows on the walls. The gravedigger lay there thinking about the dead woman's eyes staring at him. The wind blew stronger and louder, and the fire flared and flickered and popped and snapped, and he got more and more scared. Suddenly, he heard another sound. Clinkety-clink, clinkety-clink, it went. Clinkety-clink, clinkety-clink. It was the silver dollars rattling in the tin box. Hey, the gravedigger shouted, who's taking my money? But all he heard was the wind blowing. And the flames flaring and flickering and snapping and popping and the coins going clinkety-clink, clinkety-clink. He leaped out of bed and chained up the door. Then he hurried back, but his head had barely touched the pillow when he heard clinkety-clink, clinkety-clink. Then he heard something way off in the distance. It was a voice crying, Where is my money? Who's got my money? And the wind blew. And the fire flared and flickered and snapped and popped, and the money went clinkety-clink, clinkety-clink. The gravedigger was really scared. He got out of bed again and piled all the furniture against the door, and he put a heavy iron skillet over the tin box. Then he jumped back into bed and covered his head with the blankets. But the money rattled louder than ever, and way off a voice cried, Give me my money! Who's got my money? Who? Ooh, ooh. And the wind blew and the fire flared and flickered and snapped and popped and the grave digger shivered and shook and cried, Oh, lordy, lordy. Suddenly, the front door flew open and in walked the ghost of the dead woman with her eyes wide open, staring at everything and seeing nothing. And the wind blew. <laughs> And the money went clinkety-clink, and the fire flared and flickered and snapped and popped, and the ghost of the dead woman cried, Oh, where is my money? Who's got my money? Ooh, ooh. And the grave digger moaned, Oh, lordy, lordy. The ghost could hear her money going clinkety-clink, clinkety-clink in the tin box, but her dead eyes couldn't see the box, so she reached out with her eyes arms and tried to find it. The wind went and the money rattled clinkety-clink and the fire flared and flickered and snapped and popped and the grave digger shivered and shook and moaned, oh lordy, lordy. And the woman cried, give me my money. Who's got my money? Ooh, ooh. You've got it. The Bride. The minister's daughter had just gotten married. After the wedding ceremony, there was a great feast with music and dancing and contests and games, even old children's games. When they got to playing hide and seek, the bride decided to hide in her grandfather's trunk up in the attic. They'll never find me there, she thought. As she was climbing into the trunk, The lid came down and cracked her on the head, and she fell unconscious inside. The lid slammed shut and locked. No one will ever know how long she called for help or how hard she struggled to free herself from that tomb. Everyone in the village searched for her, and they looked 
almost everywhere, but no one thought of looking in the trunk. After a week, her brand new bridegroom and all the others gave her up for lost. Years later, a maid went up into the attic looking for something she needed. Maybe it is in the trunk, she thought. She opened it and screamed. There lay the missing bride in her wedding dress. But by then, she was only a skeleton.